and you're hanging out with the queen of Tuesday night, Parker J and her guests, right here. Thank you for joining us for this edition of the... You are listening to the best, the only, the only place to be on Tuesday night. That's right. You're listening to The Right Stop, and you're at the right place at the right time. From England to Canada, from Detroit to the Cocono, we are showcasing Christian authors worldwide, giving you tips, tools, techniques, and resources for you, the writer, to hone and perfect your craft. Tune in every Tuesday at 7 o'clock p.m. Eastern Time right here on WPJC 104.5. And your host, Parker J. Cole. Hi, and welcome to the show. I'm so glad you're able to join us today. Let me tell you something. I am so, so very excited because today, first of all, uh, it's a good day the Lord has made. I was sick over the weekend, just came back from the doctor, and I'm doing great. So thank you all for your prayers. Really appreciate that. And But I'm also excited because this is the day my third book in my Sins of the Flesh series released. It released today worldwide. I'm very excited about it. I'm glad that my followers have been following me. They've been leaving reviews. You've been so supportive of my career. And I just want to thank you, thank you, thank you so much for that. You can go ahead and get a copy of Vengeful Vows today. It's available at my publisher site, Alexio Publishing, as well as on Amazon.com, Barnes & Noble, or wherever book sites are sold. You definitely don't want to miss this installation of the Sins of the Flesh series. And I, again, thank you so much for your support of my career. We're going to have a fantastic time on the show today because we're going to be talking about something that may not be too far into the future. And we're going to be talking about America's Second Civil War with my wonderful guest co-host and contributor, Sean T. Smith. He's going to be helping us to really unpack that topic and it's going to be very interesting. So you definitely want to keep it right here on WPJC 104.5. If you want to call into our show, you certainly can by calling in at 646-668-8485 and then press 1 to be live on air. Or hit me on Twitter at Parker J. Cole, hashtag right stuff with your questions and comments. We're going to go ahead and take a quick short break. And when we come back, America's Second Civil War, is it just fiction or is it on the horizon? Don't go anywhere. More with Parker and her guests on the Right Stuff Radio Show. We'll be right back. Have you read the latest issue of Sormag Digital, the award-winning literary magazine for multicultural readers and writers? Sormag Digital is available quarterly and showcases interviews with the best authors in multicultural literature. Sormag Digital features craft and business articles for those interested in writing. If you're looking for a good book, check out our book reviews on what's hot in multicultural literature. For writers looking for new readers to get in front of, Sormag Digital is the perfect place to introduce your book. We offer advertising spaces that fit your promotional budget. Get your free subscription on Sormag.com or order a print issue on magcloud.com. If you would like more information about Sormag Digital, check us out on Sormag.com or contact us at Sormag at yahoo.com. Sormag Digital is the magazine for multicultural readers and writers. What's up, y'all? This is your bro, Robbie Newborn, Christian rap evangelist, ministry leader, and founder of GDT Walking Out Ministries, a drug awareness, peer mentoring, and counseling ministry that spreads a message of hope to the hopeless, bringing the gospel to the street. I am a recovery specialist, intervention, drug prevention professional, so if you're looking for a counselor or counseling or someone to just talk to, please call me at 484 525-9832. My website is www.rdsjr.com. God bless you all from all of us at GDT, Walking Out Ministries, and Team God. Peace and Christ love. Come on. Question. If you write a book, everybody will rush out to buy it. Obvious answer, no. If you were a celebrity or if you had a huge marketing budget, then maybe you can get a lot of exposure for your book. Another solution would be to check out joeytweets.com. JoeyTweets.com is a promotion and marketing service with access to over one-third of a million followers on Twitter. JoeyTweets.com has three packages available to fit any budget. That's J-O-E-Y-T-W-E-E-T-S.com. JoeyTweets.com. Get some serious exposure for your books. 
We're back, and you're hanging out with the queen of Tuesday night, Parker J. and her guests, right here on The Right Stuff. Hi, and welcome back to the show. Again, you're listening to The Right Stuff here on WPJC 104.5. I'm your host, the queen of Tuesday night, Parker J., and we're going to be talking about a very provocative topic. And one of the reasons why it's so provocative is that it's so possible this could be really happening. We could seriously be sitting on the horizon of America's second civil war. It will be an understatement to state that the political landscape has changed and heated up over the past few years. And so you have these warring parties of Republicans and Democrats, Libs and conservatives, mods, and everyone else in between is just all caught up in this um, this battle almost, this unseen battle. And so it makes me wonder, are we on the precipice of America's second civil war? Well, my special guest today is a returning guest to The Right Stuff, and he actually wrote a book based on this called The Tears of Abraham. You'll be hearing about that a little bit later on the broadcast. But we're going to be talking to him about America's second civil war and if it is really indeed on the horizon. And so without further ado, I want to reintroduce our guest co-host and contributor today, Sean T. Smith. Sean, how are you doing today? I am fantastic, Parker. Thank you for having me on again. It's always good to hear your voice. And it's always good to have you, Sean. You know, I never take it lightly when any of our guest co-hosts and contributors come on board. So I'm real glad you are here to help us unpack America's second civil war. So I'm really excited about that. And so for our listeners who are just tuning in for the first time, they may not have heard of you. Go ahead and tell us a little bit about who you are in your own words. Well, I've been writing post-apocalyptic and uh, military thrillers in a Christian vein uh, for about five years now. Um, I've got a trilogy out published by Permuted Press. Um, it's now distributed by Simon & Schuster, so it's at bookstores as well. And my newest book, Tears of Abraham, is a standalone novel uh, about the next Civil War, and that's available in Barnes & Noble and uh, all over the place in, in paperback, ebook, and uh I think it's a a very exciting topic, and it's scary. That is the best way to describe it, an exciting and scary topic. And I think one of the reasons why you describe it as that, you can always correct me, is the fact that it's so close to home. We're not just talking uh, fiction. We're talking possibilities. We're talking it's not a matter of if, it's more so a matter of when. Would you agree with that, Sean? Well, I think that it really is a possibility. Um, I'm not, I wouldn't say it in terms of if not if, then when, because I, I don't think that it's uh, very likely. Um, mm-hmm. However, when you look at all the anger in this country right now, um, it's not unlikely enough. <laughs> um, but, you know, that's, that's yeah. the premise of the book. Uh, I live in Florida, and uh, the idea hit me when there was a, a Secede Now bumper sticker with a Confederate flag um, on this car in front of me, and I got angry about it um, because, in my mind, that's treasonous um, to even talk about seceding. And so that's what sparked the book. Well, I'm glad to hear that because it's always how we writers work, Sean. Is it something that we see that touches our mind or touches our heart in an odd way, and then we go, whoa, I got to write a story about that. So I totally uh, feel you with that. You just see something, and it it, um, comes into fruition in part of your story. Now, what have you been doing since the last time you've been on the show? What have you been up to? Well, I've been writing. Uh, you know, I've been working on uh, Tears of Abraham. I think since the last time we talked, and then uh, I'm almost finished with my newest novel, which is about a. It's a really funky novel about a, an angel, and it alternates between the past and present. And in the past, he's figuring out who he is and what his role is, and in the present, he's faced with a question of, uh, can he stop Armageddon, and really should he? Uh, mm. So that's that's what I've been doing. I like that. It sounds like some deep, <laughs> introspective things going on there, Sean. <laughs> so I can tell you've been um, digging deep. I can tell you've been digging deep into your mental uh, uh, creative juices there. So that's really uh, exciting to see what you got next on Horizon. And so here we got here, we're talking about, we kind of touched on it a little bit earlier about America's Second Civil War. But some people may be thinking, you know what, it's not really a relevant topic. 
it's not really something you have to really worry about. So just in your opinion, how relevant is the topic of America's second civil war? Uh, it's very relevant. Um, Texas actually, uh, you know, they're voting on secession. Um, it's up in front of the uh, Texas Republican Party. Um, I was on a radio show in Texas a couple weeks ago, and um, there were delegates that called into the show and bought the books um, because they were, you know, they were about to vote on this thing. Um, it's not going to happen this year. Um, but you know what? If uh, if the Republicans lose, um, where does the anger go? And I don't. The, the book is very much apolitical. Um, but the bottom line mm-hmm. is, people are angry. Um, you know, on the left, you got Bernie's folks, and they're upset and throwing chairs. And on, on the far right, you got Trump's folks, and they want to build a wall, and, and they're throwing chairs too. And uh, if if it doesn't go the way people want, what happens? And that's really the premise of the book that uh, you know people are unsatisfied they feel disenfranchised uh, not represented properly by the federal government and that is a dangerous thing uh, people would call it a revolution um, mm. and, you know, the book kind of begins with that premise and I have I have friends that I respect um, who you know I, I can discuss this with and, and they don't rule it out I mean, I just kind of shake wow. my head and say, you have no idea what it would look like in reality. And I, I think that's the problem. You know, you just said something that I found extremely uh, interesting that you said that, that, you know, people talk and talk, yeah, we're going to do this, but the reality of it is much different than our thoughts about it. Because um, if you think about back with the first Civil War during the 1800s, um, these people didn't think it would last as long as it did. They didn't believe that. They thought they would be, the South said, we're going to be back home for dinner, and then they were in the conflict for five years. And so all these things um, that we talk a lot of stuff, when the reality of it hits, we're not uh, aware of just what we're talking about when we say that. And so with that, I wanted to uh, get some uh, responses from our listeners here. So Dave from Texas says, when I went pro about the question of whether or not the next civil war is on the horizon, David from Texas says, no. We are not on the verge of another civil war. Liberals will keep passively doing nothing while our liberties are eroded away, and Republicans will keep making a lot of noise and meaningless gestures and, in the end, doing jack squat to stop it. Americans no longer have the backbone to actually stand up for principles. We are content just to bleep bleep about things while sitting in front of our 52-inch TVs eroding our lives away. Dave from Texas, thank you so much for that comment. So you hear something like that, Sean. What do you think? Do you agree with him? Do you want to um, put some caveats to it? Do you completely disagree? What do you hear when you hear stuff like that? I think that in, in, uh, after, say, six more years of Democrats, he'd be a candidate to be joining the National Guard to, to go march. Mm. That's what you think, though, uh, Sean. But see, that's what people <laughs> don't. That's what, yeah. And that's what people are, because a lot of people they, they want things to be a certain way, and looks like um, it looks like for some people, it looks like the minority is taking the vote. For some other people, it looks like the majority is taking the vote. And at one point, you got to think about what are we doing here as Americans? What are we doing to make any difference here? So I think he has some good points here. So, in your opinion, what's going to cause this conflict? You kind of touched on it a little bit, but in your opinion, if we're looking at the precipice or the beginning of the precursor of the America's second civil war, in your opinion, what's going to cause this conflict? Is it the political landscape? Is it the erosion of freedoms? What's going to cause this conflict? It's all the above. I I think that uh, there is a tremendous amount of manufactured fear in this nation right now on both sides of the political Mm -hmm. aisle. And the, the media eats it up because it sells advertising. Um, and so you, they're, they're just pouring gasoline on the fire. And uh, people feel squeezed, um, even when statistically we're far better off as a country than we were eight years ago. Um, but there's the perception that we're not. And then so tied in with that, you have all the divides that have never gone away in this country. Um, you have racial divides, you have religious divides, you certainly have the socioeconomic uh, battle that's been waging. And in the meantime, you have the oligarchs at the top kind of chuckling as the, the middle eats each other. And, you know, in the book, the premise is that the oligarchs actually are the ones that trickle the war because they get cute and they they can't control it. And, you know, I, I, I think it's... Uh, 
it's not outside the realm of reality that, uh, you know, because we're so easily manipulated, we don't think for ourselves, and we, we refuse to look at facts often. And we are talking today to Sean T. Smith. He is the author of the new book, Tears of Abraham, which is discussing the uh, America's Second Civil War. You definitely want to tune in for this show because we are just getting started. If you want to weigh in on our topic, you certainly can by calling in at 646-668-8485 and then press 1 to be live on air. Or hit me on Twitter at Parker J. Cole, hashtag write stuff with your questions and comments. We're going to go ahead and take a quick short break, and when we come back, more about America's Civil War, Second Civil War. Stay tuned. Don't go anywhere. More with Parker and her guests on the Right Stuff Radio Show. We'll be right back. Are you a reader looking for more compelling Christian fiction, maybe something a little more edgy or a bit more real? Are you tired of most Christian fiction shying away from the truth and settling for a rose-tinted view of the world and its issues? Or are you an author who has a compelling story to tell, but you're afraid it doesn't jive with today's brand of Christian or secular fiction? Are you tired of Christian publishers telling you that your content is too edgy? Or maybe you've tried submitting your content under the radar to secular publishers, only to be told your themes are a bit too religious. We invite you to take a look at the Crossover Alliance. We are an online publishing company that specializes in edgy Christian speculative fiction. Speculative fiction with Christian themes and real-world content. Our company is formed from authors and readers just like you who are breaking into the mainstream and Christian markets with this compelling genre. Head over to the www.thecrossoveralliance.com for all the details on who we are, what we do, and what we accept. Right now, if you sign up for our email newsletter, you'll receive a free digital copy of our first short story anthology. Check us out today and help us spread the word about the Crossover Alliance, where light shines brighter in the darkness. You are a dreamer and creator. You are a builder and destroyer of worlds. You are a starship pilot, a dragon rider, a galactic marine, at home in the company of elves. And you get a lot of strange looks from the other authors at that Christian Writers Conference. You are a Christian speculative fiction author, and we say welcome home. Realm Makers 2016, the only conference for Christian fantasy and science fiction authors featuring classes and sessions with world-class authors and industry professionals like author Tosca Lee, agent and publisher Steve Lobby, and many more. With keynotes by four-time Christie Award-winning author Thomas Locke. Realm Makers 2016, July 28th through 30th at Villanova University, Pennsylvania. Register now at realmmakers.com. Use the promo code RADIO for a special discount. We're back, and you're hanging out with the queen of Tuesday night, Parker J. and her guests, right here on The Right Stuff. Hi, and welcome back to the show. You're listening to The Right Stuff here on WPJC 104.5. Again, I'm so glad you're able to join me today as we talk about America's Second Civil War with my wonderful guest, co-host and contributor, Sean T. Smith. Sean, once again, thank you so much for joining us on the show and helping us to really unpack the topic of the relevancy of this consideration. You know, you wrote about a fictional story. It is quite relevant to our society today, and it also speaks to a lot of the divisions that we currently have in the U.S., and so I wanted to read another comment we received. We got a comment from Beth in Broxton, Georgia. Beth says, I think that so many people are laboring all cops and authorities as perpetrators of hate. Perpe- yeah, perpetrators of hate. I believe black lives matter, but also that any life matters. Respect is earned, not given. Those that act on hate in ways that are not respectful or peaceful, regardless of what color, skin, or ethnic background, should be taken as terrorists. I feel there are ways to protest peacefully. There are ways to change laws and raise awareness like bullying or equality. This is not the 1800s anymore. It's time to wake up, stand with our brothers and sisters, respect one another for who they are, and then seek justice for the few that are violent who seek revenge and expose malice and dirty cops that give others a bad name. Uh, Beth from Georgia, thank you so much for that comment. So you hear that, Sean, and what are some of the thoughts you're thinking? Well, you know, she makes some salient points. There's, again, it goes back to fear and hate, I think. And uh, there's a reason that a lot of black folks are afraid of cops. Um, the fact of the matter is, though, most cops are good folks. Um, but there's been a real issue in the country that needs to be addressed. Uh, we can't just bury our heads in the sand. And that, uh, that sort of divide is only increasing right now. Um, and you have people that are, that are screaming. Um, what we need is to just love each other. 
You know, we need to recognize that we're all Americans. And there, there's just so much finger pointing. Um, and it just drives me nuts. I agree with you there. I think a lot of times we're not aware that there are puppeteers in the in the back, whether, whether or not we know what those puppeteers are. Sometimes we're just allowing ourselves to be played by the strings. And I think um, that's why you get so frustrated looking like, hey, you know, the other the other side of the coin too, though, Sean. I want to get your thoughts on this, especially about the racial divide of the U.S. Is that it's part of what made the country. You know what I'm saying? It's part of the the DNA of our country. Is that this country was built on these types of this this institution. It was a a very integral part of this institution that made America. And so, well, like anything that has DNA in it, it's part of your makeup. It's part of it. And so you have to fight against the uh, pool of that nature, you know, we can continue to hate whether you're African-American or Caucasian or whatever ethnic ethnic group you are, or you can move past it. So what are your thoughts when you hear that, you hear what Beth said, how she's like, you know, we got to stop doing this. What are some of your thoughts when you hear that? Well, I think that it's very easy for white folks to dismiss uh, things as being an overreaction. Um, however, when you, when you watch, uh, some of the footage that we've seen over the last couple of years, you see that there's, there's a systemic problem. So mm-hmm. if there's a reason to be angry, that reason must be addressed. Um, and I think what's happening right now is, you know, you have this Black Lives Matter campaign. And so I don't know who the guy behind the guy is pulling the strings, but they say, hey, let's do this. Here's a catchphrase, all lives matter, to defuse it. It's wrong. Mm-hmm. Um, all lives do matter. But guess what? Um, there aren't a bunch of white folks getting mowed down the streets. Um, it's just not happening like that. Um, so the, the, the problem needs to be addressed. Mm-hmm. Instead of just keeping the problem um, going over and over again like a vicious loop. And so I totally agree with you there that the problem does have to be addressed. So we're talking about this thing. We're talking about the different aspects that lead to this um, the Civil War, the Second Civil War. So do you think it can be avoided, or is it just going to happen? No, I absolutely think that it can be avoided, and I, and I believe that it will be avoided um, because I think we're better than that. Um, I pray that we are. Um, th- this, this novel is truly a cautionary tale, um, and it's, it, my target audience truly when I wrote it is for the folks that think it's a good idea um, because they don't understand that the, the civilian casualties would be terrible, uh, the, the lasting economic impacts would be terrible. We'd be vulnerable to foreign invasion. Uh, it's, it's just a tremendous can of worms. Um, but we can't avoid it by being reasonable. Now, here we are going into this election cycle, and I'm seeing a whole lot of unreasonable people. Um, you know, I've got, I'm friends with all sorts of people online, and I interact with readers and, and stuff, and, um, you know, I tend to be pretty moderate. Um, but people are getting fired up everywhere, um, whether you're a, a Bernie bro or a, a Trumpite. Um, people are just angry, and there doesn't seem to be a way to, to meet in the middle at this point. Um, and so, you know, we need we need healing as a country, and you know, maybe only that comes from God. I, I don't have the answer to that. You know, it says, um, you know, come now, let us reason together. That's definitely. Uh, a sober note when we talk about all these things, especially the political arena, which is just, uh, it's almost, like I said, it's a arena. It's not like a, a podium. It's an arena in the political arena. So I can definitely see why your heart calls out to people. We need healing. We need to heal. So I know that we can heal so we can move further as a country. And so you're talking about this whole thing about America's second civil war. So you say there's a potential and so what, what kind of makes me hesitant to say this is actually going to happen because are people really going to get up in arms and fight each other to keep the union as one, or will it fall apart? Because back in the 1800s this happened, they got up in arms, they fought each other. Will that really happen here in the 21st century? That's, that's what I want to get your thoughts on. Will it, will it really come to the point where people are going to get in arms, fight each other to keep the union as one? So what do you think? I think so. I, I think that the federal government would not let a state like Texas secede. Um, we have military bases all over Texas. We have uh, the Space Center there. It's a vast uh, oil resource. Um, it's an economic powerhouse. 
and uh, and frankly, the, the demographics in Texas are changing as well. So uh, within Texas, there will be a struggle. Uh, but I don't see the federal government just letting the South, um, you know, Sarah, go ahead, no harm, no foul. No way. Um, and, you know, within each state, you have huge divisions. And that's part of the, in the book, you know, I have uh, characters in different parts of the country. And they're, they're looking at it from the ground. And, you know, do you think Atlanta's going to be okay with seceding? Oh, no. <laughs> um, you know, it would be a bloodbath. <laughs> Lilia from Vancouver, Washington says, we Americans have such good habits of going along with the final election, mostly, I think, because we know there's always the next election. No one can take over. I fear the day we join the ranks of the nations where the losers pick up guns. Lilia, thank you so much for your comment. And then Gregory from Rochester, New York, says, New York says, that's a very good question, Parker. We are already in the middle of a cultural war with scientists being fired for questioning evolution, boys and girls being forced to share the same locker room, and our First and Second Amendment rights being taken away in the name of political correctness. Gregory, thank you so much for your comments. So as you hear some of these things, what are your thoughts? Well, it kind of lines up with the book, I guess. Um, you know, one of the one of the <laughs> it really does. Uh, you have this perception that, for example, you know, we're losing our Second Amendment rights. Um, when does that happen exactly? It hasn't is the answer. Um, but it's a fear tactic, and it's a very effective fear tactic. And in Tears of Abraham, the final straw is actually a federal gun on handgun, a federal ban on handguns, um, and that's what really breaks the the camel's back. Um, and so you see these hot button issues, um, whether it's uh, transgender stuff, which is a complete red herring. Why does this matter? It should not matter. It affects uh, just a minuscule fraction of people. Um, we've all been using the same bathrooms for as long as we've been bathrooms. Um, but there's this perception. It's, it's manipulated, manufactured fear and rage, and that is dangerous. So my next question brings me to this because you said something. You said like the transgender transgender issue is a red herring. You said um, we're really not getting our Second Amendment rights taken away. So here's the thing: if this is manufactured fear or manufactured uh, perception, things of that nature, is this, are these issues all these issues worth fighting for? What are your thoughts on that? Well, I think the country is worth fighting for. Um, Mm-hmm. You know, I don't want to fight anybody. I want to protect my family. That's what I intend to do. Um, the way that I fight is with words. Um, that's truly mm-hmm. the, the weapon that I have at my disposal. That's the staff God gave me. Um, but some of these things are worth fighting for. And in, in my mind, things like this transgender thing, it's a non-issue. Um, the whole reason that it blew up is because North Carolina passed a goofy law and uh it attracted a tremendous amount of media attention. And then Obama probably overreacted by saying, hey, we're going to take away federal funding, and then people just lost their minds. Um, mm-hmm. You know, when I go to the bathroom with my kids, I go to the bathroom with my kids. They're not in there by themselves. Um, so I, I really, you know, I, I just think that, that it's a distraction from the things that really matter. Like how about uh, we solve the poverty issue? How about we work on... Um, race relations. How about we solve our infrastructure problems? How about we put a man on Mars? How about we become a more green economy instead of letting China just crush us? Uh, we, you know, we've missed the ball in so many areas, and uh, we get caught up watching the Kardashians and the Jenner and whatever. <laughs> and reality mm-hmm. is, is happening all around us, and we're focused on the wrong things. So you talk about this thing, and I like how you said that because it really just leads into my next question. Before I do that, I want to read another comment that we received. We received the comment from um, Cindy from Santa Maria, California. Cindy, thank you for your comment. Cindy says, the last I read, more than 30 had serious succession movement. That's how the last Civil War got started. Cindy, thank you so much for your comment. Do you have any updates on that, Sean, about how many states have seriously considered succession? Well, there have been petitions passed around all through the South and the West. Um, most of them are jokes. Uh-huh. Uh, the only one that's been uh, serious is in Texas. Um, and even that is not, they just don't have the numbers for it at this point. Um, 
And again, I don't think they will. The, the dangerous thing is that Texas could actually pull it off as a, and be their own country. Um, short of California, there's not really another state that could do that um, in terms of resources, ports, agriculture, population. Um, Texas could actually do it. Um, and it would be terrible for Texas and it would be terrible for the United States. And we are still just getting started with our topic here about America's Second Civil War with my guest co-host and contributor today, Sean Smith. And if you want to weigh in on our topic, you certainly can. Simply call in at 646-668-8485 and then press 1 to be live on air. Or you can hit me on Twitter at Parker J. Cole, hashtag write stuff with your questions and comments. We're going to go ahead and take a quick short break, and when we come back, more with Sean T. in just a few moments. Stay tuned. Don't go anywhere. More with Parker and her guest on the Right Stuff Radio Show. We'll be right back. Hi, friends. I'm Dr. Mike Spaulding, inviting you to listen to great Bible teaching on the Transforming Word radio show and podcast. All shows are available on iTunes and Stitcher. Search for the Transforming Word and subscribe for notification of new shows. You may also listen to every episode from my website, www.thetransformingword.com. In addition to The Transforming Word, I want to make you aware of my interview, news, and opinion show, Soaring Eagle Radio. If you're interested in engaging conversations related to a variety of topics not covered by typical news media, then check out Soaring Eagle Radio. You may subscribe to the show on iTunes and Stitcher, and you may listen to every episode on my website, www.soaringeagleradio.com. For more information on my ministries, please email me, Pastor Mike at cclohio.com. Again, that's Pastor Mike at cclohio.com. Thank you for listening to these shows, and please leave me a note when you do. God bless you today. God gives humans the gift of making amazing stories to glorify Him. At speculativefaith.com, our ministry is to help fans explore fantasy, science fiction, supernatural stories, and beyond from an intentional and biblical Christian perspective. We share daily articles and have extensive archives tackling hot topics like end times beliefs, the art of writing, creative excellence in the Christian subcultures, discernment, sex, magic, Harry Potter, and space aliens and the Bible. If you are a parent or anyone else with a discriminating palate, our reviewers explore fantastical novels, movies, television, and games in light of God's beauty, goodness, and truth. Want to find Christian stories? The SpecFaith Library lists every fantastical novel we can find from a Christian author. It's all part of our mission to discern, engage, and enjoy fantastical human creativity in honor of our Creator, Jesus Christ. SpeculativeFaith.com Exploring fantastical stories for God's glory. This broadcast of the PJC Media Network seeks to present wholesome, thought-provoking, and entertaining content. However, the views expressed by the hosts of PJC Media are theirs and theirs alone. They do not reflect the views of this network or its affiliates. Please utilize listener discretion. We're back, and you're hanging out with the queen of Tuesday night, Parker J. and her guests, right here on The Right Stuff. Hi, and welcome back to the show. You're listening to The Right Stuff here on WPJC 104.5. We are having a fabulous discussion about America's second civil war. Is it really just fiction, or is it coming into fact? With my guest co-host and contributor, Sean T. Smith, he is the author of the new book that explores America's Second Civil War called Tears of Abraham. You definitely want to get a copy of this book today. Tears of Abraham is available on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, or wherever books are sold. I'm really excited about uh, this topic, and I'm real glad to have Sean with us today. And, Sean, we do have a caller calling in. We have a caller calling in from Georgia. Her name is Naj. Naj, how are you doing today? I'm well. I'm well. Thanks for having me on. And I know you had a question and comment for our guest, so go ahead and um, go go right ahead. Oh, okay. Uh, well, the first one would be about uh, succession. Uh, any state uh, that that attempted it would kind of go through what the people of uh, the Confederacy went through in the sense of you basically would be on an island. Uh, Other countries wouldn't trade with you. You'd have issues uh, domestically, locally, as far as getting trade across the the country. 
And then just the pressure that a country as big and as powerful as we are can put on you internationally can just make it to where you would just be kind of just stuck within yourself. And at a certain point, that just would, I, I think that would become tragic. Now, back in the day during the Confederacy, America wasn't the power that it was, so they were able to find allies with France, a little bit with England, a little bit South Africa. I don't think those allies would exist today, and I think this country, I, I think this country would be so angry at whatever state it was. I think they would kind of just force them into uh, just cr- come, to come crawling back sooner or later. And my question to you would be, uh, that's just that's just my statement. But my my question to you would be. With everything going on, by 2020, uh, with uh, I, I think what we have now is a more educated voter base who don't believe in the two parties anymore. They're willing, one side's willing to vote for a self-proclaimed socialist, another's willing to vote for a guy who's never held office and doesn't seem to carry himself well as a politician. So by 2020, do you think these two parties, uh, they just have to let 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 uh, loose their hold of uh, of America, and, and we're going to have more parties in, or or a new awakening within those parties. But in, in my opinion, they can't stay the same. Uh, what do you think about the the whole so called two party system now? Uh, that's a fantastic question, Naj. Um and I don't have a specific answer. Um, I think that we're watching the parties change and evolve right now. Um. You know, I think that we're going to have at least three parties that do emerge um, by 2020, uh, and it's probably a good thing. I mean, when you see on on both sides, uh, we have the two most unpopular presidential candidates in history and running against each other at the same time, and so I think America kind of we're scratching our heads collectively, going, "How did this happen?" <laughs> Um, and how do we prevent this kind of thing in the future? Indeed, I, I agree with question? you. Oh. Yeah, yeah, I'm indeed, sorry, I agree. It's a, yeah, indeed, I, it's a weird situation, and we're just going to have to see how it plays out. But like I said, man, you got average voters now who know about superdelegates and all these other little machinations that these parties have used over the years in order to keep power and keep the other parties outside of it. So a more educated voter base, uh, never a bad thing. Uh, And if you could also uh, weigh in on that uh, succession thing, because like I said, I I don't think people are thinking through how 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 much any country uh, would take that as a violation and an open threat. Well, to address the uh, the secession question, I think that you're spot on. Um, It would be tragic. Um, Now, in Tears of Abraham, one of the things that's happening behind the scenes is that China is involved. Um, So Mm -hmm. you have to ask yourself, what happens when foreign powers see an opportunity? Um, And so right now, China is building uh, airstrips in the South China Sea, an area that's contested by the Philippines and Japan. They're doing barrel rolls over our ships. Um, They're building a fleet. They've got an aircraft carrier now. Um, They're building submarines. Uh, They're militarizing that area, and these airstrips are capable of posting bombers that hit hit the continental U.S. In Russia, you have Russia reactivating Soviet-era bases in the Arctic. And the reason that they're doing this is they want to control the shipping lanes and they want access to the oil that lies on the Arctic as the Arctic is melting. Um, and so you have these two superpowers um, that are kind of licking their chops when they look at America. And, you know, the, the uh, Russians and the Chinese both have huge uh, social media presence in the U.S. I read memes that are tweeted and created um, by the Chinese and Russian intelligence agencies on Facebook. Um, and they're by people that would, you know, completely explode if they knew that they were doing that, but it's the truth. So mm-hmm. at the end of the day, um, I agree that uh, it would be absolutely catastrophic. Um, and that I also would say that I'm not entirely sure that we have a more educated uh, voter pace. Um, because, <laughs> people are, <laughs> because we do have Donald Trump, and I don't know how that happened at all. 
um, you know, that people have tidbits. So you, you may have someone who knows what a superdelegate is, but they don't know American history. Um, you have an entire party that embraces the founding fathers, but they don't really understand what was in the Federalist Papers. They don't understand that the, that the founding fathers were terrified of uh, having the masses rise up and wrest power from the ruling class. Um, but I'm going off the rails there. But anyway, I think the more no, people no, know, no, the better. No, 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 you're, you're, you're spot on. I, I would say, hey, let me, hey man, we've got to take small steps. So compared to where we were before, I think we have a more educated base. So I'm, I'm putting it on that standard. And as, as you just said, as the founders, you have all these people who think they identify with the founders who are the wealthy, you know, landowners who didn't want other people who didn't own land to vote. Uh, what was James Madison's statement? We must protect the, uh, the minority of the opulent from the majority. Like that was their thinking. And most Americans don't understand they should be identifying with Daniel Shea. Or, you know what I mean, <laughs> people of that ilk. But, you know, it, it's a crazy situation. But thank you all for taking my call, man. I'm just going to listen uh, to the rest of the show, man. Thank you, Naj. That was spot on. Naj, nah, thank you so much for joining to the conversation. Really appreciate your comments. And thank you so much for calling into the show today. You know, I like what uh, some of what Naj said, Sean, because he just really just uh, kind of encapsulates what a lot of different Americans are thinking in this whole thing, because you kind of go like, what happened? How did we get here? Regardless of where you stand on any particular political ladder, you kind of go like, how did we get here? <laughs> you know. And so I'm really glad that Naj put that out there and had us respond to that. I wanted to read a couple of comments that we received, um, Sean. We got a comment from William in Arkansas. William says, well, the Supreme Court said that states have the right to succeed only if Congress gives them permission. If we ever got to the point that we hated each other so much we absolutely couldn't stand to live with each other anymore, then we could theoretically decide to have Congress vote for a mutually agreeable divorce, so to speak. There wouldn't be any need to fight over it. But I fear that will only happen if the two sides were about evenly matched or if they had some other political advantage to gain from it. Otherwise, whoever was stronger would just rule the other by force which is what happened last time. Human nature is sadly predictable most of the time. William from Arkansas, thank you so much for your comment. And so when you hear that, um, do you think William has a good point? Like, well, we can say it may happen or they can succeed, but at the end of the day it's not going to happen because one, one side has more of the advantage. What do you think about that? Well, I think he's right, um, and I think that's how you have a civil war. Uh, you have uh, mm-hmm. states that say, hey, we want to secede, we want a divorce. And the federal government, which is going to be more powerful, says, no, you're not. Um, and then it gets bloody because even within the states that say, hey, we want to secede, not everybody in the state feels that way. Um, I, you know, I, I use Arkansas as an example. You've got huge areas in Arkansas that would not be okay with secession. You've got huge areas in Texas. Every state has them. Um, and then what happens? Um, how, what happens to those people who aren't being represented? Um, so th- as a nation, we've got to defuse this, um, and we really ought to be working mm-hmm. on it now. we got another comment from Jeremy in Dalton, Alabama. Jeremy, thank you for your comment. Jeremy says, I think that today's culture is a lot like the American col- colonials just prior to the revolution. Most are ticked off and view the government as oppressive, but few are willing to take the, to risk their lives to relieve themselves of that oppression. They suffer and grumble in silence, hoping against hope that things will change on their own and the government will start playing fairly. The government not willing, not willing to recognize the validity of the secessionist claims, but not willing to concede to any wrongdoing against them, seeks to quell the rebellion by force. Um, he says some more. I just want to take a time of going to... Um, edit some of this, he says, do I think this is a realistic scenario? Absolutely. And getting more likely with each passing election? I don't think we're there yet, but I do believe that at some point in the not too distant future, we'll reach a place where government has once again become the elitist others, looking upon the citizens citizens, I can't say it, citizens as mere subjects, because power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Jeremy, thank you so much for your comment. I had to edit that comment for the sake of time. And so let's get into your book really quickly, uh, Sean, in the few minutes we have left, because we've been just talking about this thing, and your book completely touches on so many different topics concerning the possibility of America's second civil war. 
So go ahead. You already kind of gave a hint of it. So as readers read Tears of Abraham, what are they going to get from reading that book? What are going to be some of the things that are going to strike them as odd or strike them uh, really deep down in the heart? What are some things they're going to get out of that book? Well, I would hope that they get out of it that a civil war is a absolutely terrible idea, that it should be unthinkable, and that it is not. And that at the end of the day, good people with good intentions are being blatantly manipulated by people that are evil with bad intentions. And when that happens, uh, innocents are lost. Uh, people die. And the scale of this thing would be beyond anything that we've seen. Uh, the first Civil War took over 600,000 American lives. Um, the second one would be in the millions. Uh, our weapons mm-hmm. are more powerful. We need more civilian casualties. And uh, it's it's just heartbreaking. And you, you know, you hear the last comment. Um, he's talking about government oppression. Um, and my response to that is, okay, some of our civil li- liberties have been eroded. There's more uh, drones. There's more surveillance. Um, there are areas where the government is more invasive in our lives. But are we oppressed? I, I really disagree with that. Um, you know, I went to a shooting range with a buddy of mine a couple of weeks ago, and he had like, 50 guns, Um, and he's still convinced that that somebody's coming for his guns. Um, And I I couldn't get an answer out of him. Like, well, how is Obama was going to do it if he didn't? Is that still going to happen? No, 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 it's going to be Hillary. Um, How how are we actually oppressed? Um, Now, the poor folks, they they can make a good argument. Um, If if you're living paycheck to paycheck on uh, minimum wage and you can't support your kids, uh, there's a feeling of oppression there. Um, but that's not the nation as a whole, and it's, those aren't the folks that are saying they're oppressed. Mm. We got a comment from Sheila. Sheila in Detroit, thank you for your comment. Sheila says, Americans are easily led and gullible. We believe the hype. We forget our history and sway, or should I say season, the facts. We blame everyone for our own mistakes and judge a few. No, I don't believe we will have a civil war, but we have now a civil unrest. Every 50 or 60 years, new attitudes emerge with new ideas, fighting for the same thing. This country was built on the ideas, risk, blood, sweat, and tears of every ethnic group. Americans war within themselves. Sheila, thank you so much for that comment. And it kind of brings me to a question I had to ask you, because I think at the end of the day, this question really tops it all. Is America worth fighting for? Because a lot of the comments have been, well, Americans are this, or Americans are that, the country's this, the country's that. And at the end of the day, with all these different types of attitudes, is America worth fighting for? The dream of America still exists. I'm not sure the dream was ever true, but that doesn't mean it's not worth fighting for. Uh, when you look back at our history and how far we've actually come as a country, um, it's, it's staggering. Um, we are the, the leading power in the entire globe. Uh, we have the smartest scientists. We have hardworking people um, that are incredibly industrious and creative and think outside the box. And that's what has made us so strong in the marketplace, uh, particularly over the last hundred years. Um, and what we're seeing now is the country evolving. And I hope it grows in the right direction, not the wrong direction. Uh, because you certainly can have a country that um, becomes fascist. Uh, when, you, when you have that fear that is so pervasive, people tend to become more authoritarian. And people like Donald Trump become attractive uh, because we're going to blame everything on the minorities. Well, never mind the fact that we're all minorities unless you're out skinning bucks, uh, you know, your great, 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 great grandparents. And uh, we're in moccasins. We're all immigrants. And we are so. Uh, Oblivious of that fact. Now, I'm all, I, I agree. We've got to protect our borders. Um, yeah. But the answer is not with hate. Uh, that's, that's not the way to do it, and that's what's happening right now. We're scapegoating entire populations. Um, and, again, it's, it's pouring gasoline on the fire. And we, we deserve better than that as a country. So people who read Tears of Abraham, and I like how you said that, that we deserve better than that as a country because it really highlights – your desire that we all be united. And that's what 
Um, I like what you said, the dream of it is still alive. Whether or not it's realistic, the dream of that is still alive. And so readers are reading the Tears of Abraham. What are their thoughts? How are they responding to this very more like a poignant book that you've written? How are they responding to that? Um, I've had some really nice notes, uh, some kind notes from readers. Um, uh, Hugo Award winner David Brand actually called me on the phone. Um, that was a moment right there. Um, wow. Me to, you know, tell me he loved he loved the book, and uh, so it's you know it's, it's been a very engaging process. I've been on um, a bunch of different radio shows here locally too, and um, it's interesting to talk to readers and people that follow politics and um, you know banter things about. Um, so I've got folks that are very conservative that really like the book, and I've got folks that are really liberal that like the book, um, and that was my hope when I wrote it um, that I could really write it up a little. Yeah, I think because you kind of broke down the divide and just got to the humanity of people. That's probably why it just reaches across political lines because it gets to the humanity of people and your sincere desire for all of us to come together. And that anyone listening to you right now, Sean, can tell, you know, your deepest desire that we all come together, be united, and move forward, you know. And um, I can tell that with the Tears of Abraham, that's probably one of the things you wanted to portray and to at least bring that message along with Tears of Abraham. And, you know, I'm a fan of you, Sean. You already know that. I remember when I first read Wrath Series, <laughs> I kept blowing up your Facebook PM. I just kept blowing it up like, oh, my gosh, this happened. Oh, my gosh, this happened. And I remember uh, running into the uh, restroom to read because I was at work and <laughs> trying to read. And <laughs> it was fantastic. And, uh, you know, you're a fabulous writer, and I know others think that as well. And so with that in mind, we get close to the end of our show, what other projects do you have coming up for us to titillate and get our creative juices just flowing, waiting for you to write it, besides the other one with the angel? What was the, uh, what was the uh, any other, other ones you have? No, I'm, I'm, I'm still completely focused on the, uh, the angel book. Um, it's by far the hardest thing I've ever tried to write. It's just super ambitious. Um, the, the working title right now is Into the Valley of the Shadow. And uh, Malak is the main character, and he's an angel with issues. Um, he is not like other angels because he has free will. And uh, mm-hmm. the book opens with him watching the crucifixion and then being killed. Um, mm-hmm. and so he comes back to life throughout history, um, and he <laughs> he doesn't really have any direction. He's got to figure things out. Um, and uh, in, in the present time, he has assembled over time this uh, – special operations team, a private company of uh, hackers and trigger pullers and uh, intelligence officers, and he's trying to do good. Um, but sometimes things backfire. Ain't that so the truth. <laughs> <Right. laughs> Road to hell, paid Ain't with good intention. So, you know, he's, he, the character, he's, he's, he's been a uh, – He's been a monk. He's been a scholar. He's been he was a crusader for a while. Um, he's he's been uh, part of various things in history that are that are true, and so I had to do just a tremendous amount of research uh, for this book for the history because I'm really trying to stick um, to history and say well what what might have triggered this event, um, and so for example the burning of Rome. Um, Malak caused Rome to burn, which then uh, caused Nero to begin to really persecute the early Christian church, which led to the spread of the church. Um, so it's that kind of thing where he's not, you know, he's not buddies with any major historical figures, um, but he's a linchpin throughout history. I find that profound. I can't wait till it comes out, Sean. So hurry up and get it done. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Hurry up. Don't you, um, I love I love hearing that. I can't wait to read it. Like I said, I'm a fan of your work, as you already know, so I'm really uh, excited for your new projects. So if people want to get a hold of you, where can they find you online? Um, I'm pretty easy to find. I'm on uh, Facebook. Um, you can Google me, Google Sean T. Smith. Um, that's S-E-A-N. Um, you'll see a bunch of stuff. Um, but I love to interact with readers on Facebook. Um, I'm also on Goodreads, although I'm less active there. Um, I'm on Twitter at, as a, at Squibe Sean Smith. Um, I'm on LinkedIn. Um, so 
so yeah, I'm, I'm very easy to find. Uh, the Tears of Abraham is actually in bookstores now, so it's on the shelves um, under new science fiction. Um, so you can run out and grab a copy. And I hope our listeners listening will go ahead and get a copy of Sean's Tears of Abraham today. And don't forget to pick up all his other works. You will be so pleasantly and thrillingly surprised. He is a fantastic, prolific writer, um, does a lot of military fiction. I love his work. And like I said, Sean, you remember I was attending your Facebook just reading, and it was so fun reading and being in that world. I mean, uh, when I grow up, Sean, I want to be like you. <laughs> definitely. When I grow up, I definitely want to be like you. Now, you know this show, Sean, is all about encouraging writers to write. You know that. And, you know, we want to be able to use the gift that God gave us to do that. And so in our final thoughts for the show, I want you to speak encouragement to our listeners out there whom God has given them the gift to write and they haven't picked up a pen yet. Speak to them and encourage them today. Well, if you want to write, you got to write. Um, so you, if you talk about writing, uh, you're not a writer. If you talk about it more than you actually write um, so you got to just put your butt in the chair and do it and um, be honest. Um, I think that's probably um, one of the biggest pitfalls um, that I see in, in, in what's out often today is that people are lazy and they, they lie. They're, they don't write the really tough scene. They want to circumvent it. Um, so just plow right in and be honest and good and true and, uh, let your imagination truly roam, uh, because really that's that's the joy of storytelling is when you're you're just creating stories. I, I look at it like almost like there are these uh, colored threads uh, floating through the air, and I I try to grab one. Um, as a songwriter, I, I really just felt it sometimes when I'm in a room with another writer, and we just feel that uh, creative energy. And if you can tap into that, um, it's really something. It's it's joyful. I can't think of a better note to end the show with today, Sean. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much for being with us on the show. And we sincerely hope to have you back soon. Well, thank you so much, Carter. It was a real pleasure. And um, I would love to be back on, and I'll, I will talk to you soon. Have a good night, Sean. You too. And we were talking today to Sean T. Smith. He is the author of the book Tears of Abraham, which is available in bookstores now, as well as online at Amazon and Barnes and Nobles. You definitely want to go ahead and get a copy of this book today, as he takes a very realistic view of the possibility of America's civil war, second civil war. And as you read the book, make sure you love him, my brother today and leave a review. Let him know how you enjoy the book. And you can also connect with him online. Simply go to his uh, Twitter. His Twitter is scribe. Um, scribe Sean Smith. You can go on Twitter and follow him there. Google him on Twitter. He does interact with his readers, so if you want to talk to Sean, Google him on Facebook or search him on Facebook, and you can get a uh, talk to him and just let him know how his work touched you. If you have any questions, he definitely will be uh, connecting with you. Again, thank you so much for joining me for this edition of The Right Stuff. As I already told you before, the show, my book, has released today, Vengeful Bows, available on Amazon.com, my publisher site, Electio Publishing, or wherever books are sold. Go ahead and get a copy of that today. Thank you so much for joining me for this edition of The Right Stuff. You have a wonderful, wonderful blessed day, and God bless. Thank you for joining us for this edition of The Right Stuff. Follow Parker online at parkerjcole.com. To hear this show and other shows, visit the show archive at therightstuffradio.wordpress.com. We'll be back same time next week, 7 p.m. Eastern Time.